Front Row MMA here at the UK MMA Expo in Manchester, and I'm fortunate enough to be joined by Leon Roberts. Thanks for taking some time to Absolute see us. Pleasure. Absolute pleasure. You know, this is the first event of its kind. We've had we've had expos that have involved a little MMA with other traditional martial arts, but this is the first yeah. that is you know distinctly MMA. How important is this type of event to the growth of the sport in this country? Hugely important. I think it just goes to show that if you can have an expo which is just primarily MMA, it goes to show you that MMA is growing. Um, and the people in there are here because of MMA, not because there's strongman stuff or weightlifting or anything else. It's all about MMA. No traditional sports here. They, they've got their place, but this is pure MMA. So for me, it's really great to see the growth of the sport, to see the vendors in there, the people that want to get involved, you know, the, the fighters, the competitors that are in there, you know, the, the, uh, the cage fighting yesterday, actually the, the no-gi competition today, all different facets of MMA in there, which, you know, is great. And how important is it for sort of the fans, the, the guys that are watching this on the telly and going to the events, uh, how important is developing that personal relationship with them when you get to meet them face to face in terms of helping the sport grow? Uh, you know, that's huge as well. I mean, you've got fighters in there that are walking around and the general public can go and have a chat with fighters. So they're not just seeing them as a fighter, they're seeing them as a person. You know, they're chatting about their lifestyle, their kids, their families, their training methods, everything else. And that's what creates a good fan base. I mean, you've got Colin Fletcher in there who stands out because <laughs> of his weird and wacky persona which is fantastic and people want to know is he really that crazy yeah. and then you got people like Shay Mills who's by nature very quiet and very humble but he's out there you know meeting people talking to people and I think a lot of people have got a lot of questions to ask fighters which you can sometimes do on forums or see other interviews but to actually have that face-to-face -face dialogue with people that you've been watching is hugely important and it builds a fan base up and it actually lets people know that fighters are, are human beings you know they're not just people that go in in a pair of shorts and four-ounce gloves and beat each other up there's something to them and that's what people warm to and people you know that's what creates that fan base which is fantastic well you say the fighters but you know you've been around for two days and I've seen you stopped plenty of time to have a picture taken you know how does how does how do, uh, how does how does that make how does that make you feel because of course it, it's right that we celebrate the fighters and I don't think we do it enough but I think it's also it's also right that we celebrate those people that allow the fighters to do what they do the judges and the referees and do, does that does that kind of fan interaction is that important to you um I don't know whether it's important it's, it's interesting I find it very interesting that somebody would want me to sign a t-shirt or a picture or have a picture taken I mean that you know that's kind of bizarre for me um, I know a lot of referees who are very sort of uh, more in the limelight enjoy that type of interaction and I find it very humbling that somebody would want to come and spend a few minutes and ask me some questions and, and, and etc. I like it when fans come and ask me about certain decisions, certain fights, because it's, it's feeding them knowledge, which is, which is really good. Um, but yeah, it's, I don't think anybody will. I don't think anybody should do this in an official capacity for, for fame or fortune or wealth or, or notoriety. It's about doing something you love doing. And if people want to come and ask me a few questions, I have a picture taken because I'm doing something I love doing, you know, that's fantastic, although very weird. Yeah. I, do, I do find it strange, but, you know, it's, it's, it's great. Have you, have you ever had that fan that's come up and, and sort of, well, how, how, how could you have stopped it there? What were you thinking? Have you ever, you know, have you ever been berated because, you know, you, lo you lost them a bet or something? <laughs> I, I've, had, I've had interesting conversations with family members and, and corner staff and coaches after, but fans, not so much. They're just kind of like, why did you do that? And they might be very heated and everyone can sit and watch a fight make their own decisions but when you actually explain what you're looking for you know how the fight runs how it's judged what you're looking for you know it allows them to understand okay so you did make the right decision then instead of them saying oh you're just like <laughs> a bleep 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 you know <laughs> You, because we're talking about MMA and you know I think most people will recognize you if nothing else because of your capacity as a Uf, UFC official uh -huh. yeah. um, you know when did you get when did you first get started in MMA and you know this is a uh, this is gonna be a cheesy question but what made you fall in love with the sport because it's no, obvious it's, that's not a cheesy question at all because if, if if MMA becomes part of your lifestyle, which it is for me, you do fall in love with it. It's, it's like a marriage, you know? And it doesn't mean that you have to be a fighter. There's so many different components of MMA that you can just grasp. You know, I've been training nearly 20 years now in MMA. Um, was present at the first uh, MMA competition in this country. I was cornering uh, Mark Weir, which was uh, 1996, a competition called Yoram. I think it was in Bracknell, um, which had you know, other 
you know, uh, pioneers involved in it. And, you know, for me, I used to play rugby when I was younger, had a back, in, uh, a back injury and I was told I couldn't do com contact sports. So I gave up everything. I thought, you know what, I've got to do something. Uh, I found MMA. And to be quite honest, the realism of it was, you know, it started off with me and sort of 10 other doormen training in a little shed, beating the bejesus out of each other. And then you realize there's more technical side to it. You know, a lot of people say they watched the first UFCs and fell in love with Hoist Gracie. I have to admit, when I first watched those, it bored me. Jiu Jitsu yeah. bored me. I just like seeing two guys go toe to toe, battering each other. That's what drew me to the mixed martial arts. It was only when I started training and I was thinking, how can a guy that's half my body weight? submit me that's what made me fall in love with, with jiu-jitsu then uh, or jiu-jitsu grappling which whatever you want to call it so yeah so with Mark we're here for 20 years I'm still there now and to be quite honest because there's so much you can do with it you can do your stand-up you can do your strength and conditioning you can do your Thai boxing you can do your jiu-jitsu you know no gi gi whatever there's so many different components and facets it's impossible to get bored of it the only thing is there's so much you love doing you haven't got enough time in the day to put everything in yeah. And how did you make the transition from you know training in the shed to going to the gyms to becoming an internationally recognized uh, MMA official? Completely by chance, in all honesty. <laughs> um, the, the place we used to train was Mark's dad's old shop, which was in the city center of Gloucester, where I come from. Uh, and, and basically, we expanded to go to a school hall, and then we decided to get our own gym. So we got our own gym, which now we've just opened another gym now. And it was kind of... The referee side of things, Mark Weir, when he was fighting the UFC, we had an organisation called XFUK, which was a management committee, which I was part of, and we decided to put on a show to raise some money to help fund us get abroad, because obviously back then, we didn't have sponsors, yeah. we had to raise our own money. And we needed a referee, and a guy said, oh, would you referee? And somebody made reference to me, big John McCarthy, and I was like, I'm not doing it because you think I'm some big guy that can yeah. stand there. And the guys approached me and said, no, your knowledge is good, we want you to go in there. And I was like, okay, to help you out, I'll do it. So I did um, XFC1, which is 2002, which was our first show, and some other promoters were there I said, would you come and work for us? And it gradually snowboard and snowboard. Did a show called Urban Destruction um, for a guy called Charlie Joseph, who used to run Trojan Fee Fighters. And on that show was Grant Waterman and Andy Gear judging. And they watched me and they said, could you, would you come and work for Cage, Cage Rage, as it was then? Work for Cage Rage, Cage Rage goes on YouTube, the UFC see me on YouTube, call me for an interview for London. And the rest is history. There, I'm working for the UFC. And can you remember what the the first UFC fight you you ever oh, yeah. uh, what, UFC 89 Birmingham, Per Eklund against Sammy Shavo, and it was the very first prelim of that night. So by default, I became the first British referee in the UFC. wasn't the first appointed, but by default, because of the assignment we had. I was the first one to actually officiate in the octagon, which is something that, you know, it's a huge deal for me. They talk about fighters, you know, getting the octagon jitters, you know, it doesn't matter how experienced they are, if they've come in from another promotion, they, is the same, is the same true for the officials? Was, was there any sense of, oh, the whole, um, this is, this is big? Oh, hell yeah. Oh yeah, the first, I mean, the night before I didn't sleep, I was thinking, what, you know, what am I doing, you know? But then you think in your back of your head, I wouldn't be asked to work on the biggest show in the world if I wasn't capable of doing it. And that's what you draw your confidence from. But when you get in there, you forget everything. Yeah. I mean, I can't speak for everybody, but yeah. for me, when you're sitting in the crowd, you think, looking at the audience, you've got all the superstars sat there, you've got Dana White, you've got the owners sat there. It's gone, millions of people watching it, worldwide pay-per-view. <clears throat> as soon as I step into that cage, forget about it. Yeah. I could be anywhere. I could be in a little sports hall or doing the UFC. Your focus is on those two guys. Once the fight finishes, that's when you're like, wow, you look at the crowd again. And that's how I deal with it. I don't get, I don't get in awe of who's watching, who's there, how many people are watching, where I am. It's just focusing on those two guys. And that's how I manage to, how I manage to process it in my head. Yeah. So, so we were talking about you know, the, the, that first time yep. in, in the octagon. And the fact that you shut everything out. Mm. Uh, anybody involved in UK MMA, we, we've we've been around. We've seen you at events from the local amateur championships yep. to you know to UC MMA and. All. <laughs> Do you get as much, and I think I know the answer, it's a stupid question, but how much pleasure do you get out of, you know, refereeing those, you know, debuting amateurs as compared to perhaps getting a world title show? Oh, Is there yeah. any... Do you know what? It doesn't matter if I'm doing two amateurs in grassroots or the UFC, you know, for me, being part of it is massive. And everyone would say, well, that's crazy because you're working with the UFC, that's fantastic. And it is. I'm very humbled and very honoured. You know, Mark Goddard, myself, and now Neil Hall, you know, the only three English referees... 
you know, three British referees, I should say. And people forget that we're not employed by an athletic commission. We're employed directly by the UFC. So that is that is massive. But to get in a cage with two guys who have trained hard and are making their debut, to be part of that, to be part of that little memory for them, for me, is huge. And, you know, I, I did a show not so long back, and I don't think I should mention any particular shows on here. Yeah. Where um, a particular camp had, I think, six or eight guys fighting, is all their debuts, and a couple of them came over to me and asked questions, and the whole camp came over. And for me, it was so refreshing to see these guys at grassroots level wanting to find out about this, that, asking me different um, questions, different, you know, what I look for, because they want to educate themselves. So when you're part of that, to me, that's really exciting and real refreshing, because gone are the days where MMA was all about two guys are on a couple of beers get in there and you know now it's very technical and the guys want want to educate themselves and being part of that is great yeah. I, again I don't know if it's a question you can ask because you you when you're in the cage you're do, you're there doing a job but has, has there ever been an assignment or a fight where where you've looked at it and gone oh man I, I wish I was watching that one. Oh man you know and and if what's your favorite fight that you've been involved is there is there a fight that you've it's been a, an honor to be involved with I know probably all of them yeah but, yeah but one that stands out one that makes you go fall I'm, you know I'm a part of history there. do you know I think when you talk about part of history I mean I was very fortunate enough to do the very first um, flyweight competition which was in Australia between Demetrius Johnson and Ian McCall now you can watch it on the telly and you can think well those guys are fast but when you're in there, the speed you have to referee at, and I'm, I'm a referee that's very active anyway. Uh, um, we all have our different styles of refereeing, but for me, I don't like to stand still. I like to be constantly moving. That's how, that's how I operate. And it was like refereeing a fight on fast forward. And obviously, it was in Australia. It was in Sydney. It was warm. And you know, to be part of that history in the making was great. But I remember when I came out. The other officials were like, wow, that must have been crazy refereeing that fight because it was so fast. And I remember Stitch, who's a cut man for the UFC, yeah. had a bit of towel and an ice bucket and he rinsed it out and put it on my head. He goes, I think you need that because it was <laughs> so hot in there. You know, so that, that, was a, that was a real good memory for me, that one. Uh, rolling back 18 months ago, perhaps, uh, a little, uh, there were, you had a health scare. Uh, Absolutely, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, 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 it's, it's, it's hard. I don't quite know how to, how to bring it up in oh, question. Oh, please bring it up. I'm, I'm uh, open to talk about it. You, you, you were diagnosed with cancer. Cancer, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, did, did, was, were, you, were you feeling rough? Were you, or did it, how did that diagnosis come about? Um, my diagnosis was a self-diagnosis, and I recommend to anybody, even if you're not in a contact sport, check yourself out. Yeah. So for me, because you sometimes get knocked, you know, yeah. in your groin area, you know, once, twice a week. If you, if you say so. <laughs> <laughs> you know, once, twice a week in a shower, you know, you might, you know, you should check yourself out. Or if you want to make it fun, get your partner, your wife, yeah. your boyfriend, your girlfriend to check you out. And I noticed a lump there, and I was like, hmm. Went on Google, self-diagnosed, and thought, ah, it's nothing serious. The lump got bigger. I was feeling a little bit drained, but I just thought it was overtraining. Um, went to a couple of GPs and they were not too sure. So I went to see a specialist and literally as soon as he examined me, he was like, well, you know, I want you on the operating table in two days. And it was, um, I, no I noticed that it got the, the growth, it was testicular cancer I had. The growth had got quite big because when you move, yeah, it was, felt a bit, bit of discomfort. Um, and it was, it's four days, I think it was, before I was used to fly out to Brazil to referee for the UFC. So I said to him, I said, look, Delay the surgery. I'll go. To, I'll go to Brazil because I feel fit to go, and uh, you know I'll have the surgery when I get back. And when he looked at me, he said, "You're joking, mate. That needs to come out now." I realised then how serious it was. Yeah. So the actual procedure is called an orchidectomy. Where they <laughs> uh, am I, I ready? For, am I ready for I this? I don't know how much <laughs> detail you want to go into. Uh, 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 but as much as you're comfortable, because I think if nothing else, it's important. That yeah, absolutely. I think that when I when I realised I had to have the the tumour and the testicle removed, you just think that they're going through the sack and pull it out. But no, no, no. It's, it's, it's like having a cesarean section. They slice you across the stomach and pull it up through. So, needless to say, I was laid up for four to six weeks. Uh, I think if you'd have seen me, you would have thought it was a documentary for 10 ton team. Because I was sat there eating, unable to move. The, the chemotherapy and the radiotherapy gave me a, a very unusual appetite. Oh, mashed well, potato and bread. So lots of carbs. Carbon up, and because I couldn't do anything. Yeah. So I'm just sitting there ballooning, and I'm, I'm not the slightest of chaps anyway. I, I've got to tell. I think that's my problem. Yeah. <laughs> so so yeah, I you know went through the chemotherapy and the radiotherapy, um, and you know the support I had was just you know absolutely amazing. So yeah, I, I, um, the specialist advised me not to train, but I think when you know your own body. 
Um, I started training. I've got some very understanding and professional training partners who helped me back through. Um, strength and conditioning, got back into jiu-jitsu, got back into some MMA and um, basically finished my treatment. Where are we now? Finished my treatment end of February. I uh, had to wait a certain amount of time because when you have radiotherapy every day, it aggravates everything. So they can't check if it's cleared because it looks so bad. So I went back for my CT scans and I got the all clear two weeks ago. Um, which now means three monthly checkups for the first year and six monthly checkups and annual checkups for seven years, which is a standard thing they do yeah. for cancer. So yeah. You know, I can remember you going on social media on Facebook um, and I think it was after the surgery and you'd started to recover. Your, your friends and family were supportive, but you expressed almost shock at the amount of you know how, you know, how 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 humbling an experience was that, and what did um, and what did you take from it? I can't even put into words how humbling it was, um, because people have asked me why I wasn't doing the UFCs. Oh, I've heard about your health. I thought I don't usually go on Facebook for personal things, but I thought I needed to let people know from the horse's mouth. No Chinese whispers. This is how it is, and literally the whole day. The Facebook was just pinging, pinging, pinging. Hundreds and hundreds of messages were coming through, which for my wife and my mother was massive because they got you know a lot of strength from it. And it got to the point where it was almost too emotional to read. I was like, these people from all over the world, who are new, but also people were friend requesting me just to send me get well soon messages. I mean, to me that's crazy. And <clears throat> I don't think it's got anything to do with me being involved in. MMA, a lot, of the, a lot of the responses I got, it was because cancer affects so many people. And it was like, wow, here's a guy that's having a battle, you know, let's give him some support. But the MMA community itself, you know, uh, massive. You know, m m colleagues of mine from America, referee Dan Mergliotta, who people know from the UFC, I told him, he went straight to the uh, travel agents to book a flight to come over to see me. Oh. You know, and I rang him up and said, please don't waste your money, I'm, I'm, I'm not that ill, you know. I, did, I wanted to be little, you know. But, you know, the UFC, I had the UFC top brass sending me emails to, you know, find out my health and everything. You know, so from, so from people I've never met before, right up to people who have been involved in the sport for years, giving me that support was humbling, overwhelming, and I could think of a load of other words to say, yeah. which don't spring to mind, but yeah, it's crazy. So What's yeah. the prospect of being able to get back in the cage, and, and, and we, I'll use the UFC again because it's the biggest show on yeah. earth. This is, it's what everybody aspires to, whether you're, it doesn't matter who Absolutely. you are in the sport. Yeah. How much motivation did that provide to, 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 to you wanting to recover quickly, but, but well? It was my, my secondary motivation after my family. My wife and my kids obviously was my motivation. Um, but for me, sitting on the sidelines, being out of MMA, it's when you're forced out of something, you realize how much actually you love it. Now, as a referee, you know, we get lots of stick, you know, we're, in, we're putting ourselves in a situation where at any given moment we can have a hundred people on our backs, this, that and the other. But for me, not being able to do it, I realized how much I did love it because I missed it terribly. Uh, and when you went back, because was it Wembley, I think, you the, yes. the, the return, as it were, the return? Um, was that... Is that an emotional day, or was it? You know, did you not? Were you not able to sort of think of it in that way? Because I'm at work. I had to, I had to put it out of my mind. But um, <clears throat> I think it was probably November, December time. Mark Goddard actually contacted me and he said, "Look, I've got to win the UFCs in February." And he said to me, "Get yourself well for it." He said, "Come on, let's get focused on it." Because he knew that I was missing things. So as soon as he gave me that phone call, my mental state then was, "I am going to be in that cage and I'm going to be refing." Um, so when I actually came round to it, I remember driving down to the arena, parked my car up, got out of the car. And it was quite interesting because I had all these emotions, but as I, as I parked up the car, Mark Goddard was there and he'd had an issue with a certain fighter in a press conference. So that was kind of consumed. <laughs> the conversation was consumed with that. So for me, my, my head was taken away from my own sort of, and then uh, me and Mark went out for, for a meal and I had a chat and then it was just like okay I'm gonna get back into my zone everything I normally do when I prepare myself for a show that's what I'm gonna do and I just got back into it normally and um, it was only when Fighters Only contacted me and asked to do an interview I was like wow okay there's a lot of interest around this you know um, but once the show was over that's when I was kind of like, you know, my wife went on Facebook and she was saying how proud it was to see me there. And of course, everyone jumped on the bandwagon saying, oh, I was great to see you back, this, that, and the other. And it was, that was kind of like, I can't read that right now because it's a little bit, a little bit emotional yeah. sort of thing then. But, but yeah.
I'm so clear. It's, I mean, it's wonderful news that two, two weeks ago you've been given the all clear, and I know that everybody, like everybody watching this, is going to hope that that's it now. You, so. Get forever. so, so let's look at the future of uh, of MMA, and, and not necessarily the UFC. Now we'll come back to we'll come yep. back to the UK. Mm -hmm. What's what steps do we need to take now? We've got this, you know, we've got safe MMA. It's coming into its yep. sort of ninth month. You've got the uh, the IAM the IA double M. MAF, the UK, the MAF, yep. uh, these federations are starting to, yep. where do we go next and uh, how, how long is the journey going to take? Because I believe people will think it's going to be, and we should be ready to go. Yeah, unfortunately that's, that's kind of short-sightedness. It's going to be a very, very long journey. You know, people say the light at the end of the tunnel, well you might see a teeny, teeny little bit of light down there, and that's not being negative, it's just that's how long we've got to go. But those of us that are on board, know it's going to be a long trip and we're happy to go on that long trip because at the end of it there's something extremely positive that's going to happen and it's not going to be just for the fighters it's going to be for every single person who's involved in MMA you know having, in a, having a governing body having things like safe MMA coming along it's just going to benefit us you know we want this sport to be mainstream you know whether it's going to be up there with boxing rugby football who knows you can't say what's going to happen. But as long as we've got positive, like-minded individuals who are willing to give up their time, you know, and, and their own expenses, you know, when we meet up to do the governing body, when the guys meet up to do safe MMA, there's no one saying, there's your money for your travel, you know. It's, it's us saying, this needs to happen. And I think as long as those positive people are there, and there's a lot of us out there, and there's more people that want to be involved, you know, we can get a standardised rule set, we can get a, a governing body that will oversee everything to make sure everything's above board. And when that happens, that's when MMA in itself becomes more acceptable, it becomes safer, and people don't see it as cage fighting. It's MMA, it's mixed martial arts, it's a sport. It's not WWE entertainment, you know? It's, it's not two guys getting in there and fighting to the death with no rules, valley to do. It's mixed martial arts. It's a mixture of, you know, martial arts. And that's what people need to, you know, take hold of. And, you know, if I didn't think it was gonna happen, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be involved in it. And it might not happen while I'm still involved in MMA, but it will happen. You know, and you know, with with the people that are involved, and and they're people that have been involved in the sport for years, not just sort of oh, this UFC thing seems popular. It's it's people who have truly been at the grassroots mm -hmm. and at the beginning. You know, but with the connections and 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 the people that you guys know, are you getting support too from perhaps you know the Las Vegas medical, you know, or New Jersey, or you know these commissions that obviously have been able to run these events? Yeah. Do they give advice? Are you getting help from outside? Yeah, I don't think I don't think it's appropriate for me to say who and, 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 and where, but there's a lot of people in a lot of high places that are like, you know, you guys are onto a winning formula here. If we can help you out, let us help you out. Ask us questions, ask us advice, you know. We've got medical professionals that are involved in the Olympics. Yeah. You know, it doesn't really come higher than that. You know, um, we've got people from overseas that are doing a similar thing that we're doing. So it's kind of like, well, actually, we're all singing off the same hymn sheet. Let's meet up. Let's talk. Let's have dialogue. So we're not an island into ourselves in this. There. Exactly. Exactly. And, and how important is the wider MMA community going to be to helping UK MMA branch out? Huge, because it needs acceptance. You know, it's no good just saying this is what we're going to do, because there's no. There's nothing that's going to force people into it because, you know, if you force people into it, that's when people rebel against things. It's actually saying, this is what needs to happen. This is why it needs to happen. Let people see, you know, your documentation. Yeah. This is why we're going to do these things. So then people in the wider community can say, actually, th this makes sense. This is what needs to happen. So we want to jump on board. We want to help you. And that's when your, your sort of MMA family gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And, and that's what needs to happen. I, mean, I want to thank you for taking 30 minutes out of your day to, to come and chat with us. And, and it's, it, I'm going to, I got, I'm a fanboy. I got to admit, you're one of the, you're one of the nicest guys you could possibly oh, meet in MMA. And it, it's just, I'm just so grateful that you give your time up for us and for this oh, sport. Before we let you go, there is there anybody you want to give a shout out or anybody you want to say hello to? Because quite frankly, I do it with every interview. Wow. How many people do I want to say hello to? First, firstly. Uh, do you want to hold the mic then? Because I'm, I'm tired in the cage. I, I just want to say, uh, thank you to everybody who showed me support through my illness. Um, you don't realize how much your your text messages, your phone messages, uh, your Facebook messages meant to me and my family. So thank you very much to you guys. Uh, my guys at Mark Weir's uh, Range Academy in Gloucester, you know, 
people like James Millard, Chris Hughes, all my training partners, Ali Mason, my jiu-jitsu coach, all the guys that showed me um, and gave me the time I needed to get back to full health. And uh, Mr. Goddard, and I'm not going to embarrass him if he watches this, but you know exactly why I'm thanking you. And mainly my, uh, my wife, I guess, because uh, through every guy there's a, a great woman and she truly is a great woman and she's been with me for the past 17 years. I think we've been together and she's supported me through and through. So uh, God bless, I love you all. He's going to get away with, I think, the I past think, 17 years. I think the past 17 years. Yeah, we've been together <laughs> almost 10, it'll be 10 October, December 24th. You see, you see the difference. So. Are you sure about that? <laughs> No, I just made it up. You just made that up? <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> this is what it feels like on me when the shoe's on the other foot. I don't like this very much. <laughs> Liam, thank you so much for your time. A pleasure as always. Oh, really appreciate it. Anytime.